All right, uh, please welcome our last speaker of the day, uh, Ryan Williams. Hello, <clears throat> thanks for sticking around. I'll try to get us out of here on time. Uh, I'm gonna talk about a multi-dimensional array library I've been working on that heavily leverages the type level eco ecosystem. Uh, I work at Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York. I did this work under a grant from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative that was part of the Human Cell Atlas, which is a cool project I'll talk about in a bit. Um, and uh, yeah, so here's the agenda. There's a genomic sequencing technology breakthrough that is exciting that I'll tell you about. It produces a lot of matrix data. Um, there are some tools in untyped languages that analyze that data. I would like to use Scala to also analyze that data for reasons that I'm sure we're all sympathetic to. Uh, I will look at a few different levels of type safety that we might like from an array uh, library and show what uh, the library that I've made can do. Uh, yeah. So real quick overview of some of the domain context in the sequencing stuff. Uh, all of the genomic sequencing that you've ever heard of is bulk sequencing. We pool a bunch of cells and we sample DNA, DNA and RNA from the population of those cells. Uh, that's just like what the chemistry tricks that we've discovered enable. Uh, in principle, we would like to actually measure individual cells, RNA or DNA. Uh, that's historically not really been possible. It's particularly useful in some biological domains like cancer or uh, when you're studying uh, the immune system where there's different subpopulations of cells that interact in subtle ways that are important to know about. Um, and so in the last 10 years, we've developed ways to basically uh, sequence single cells RNA. Uh, the way it works is uh, by using the existing bulk sequencing infrastructure, but with a clever barcoding trick upstream of that where we push the cells through this oil emulsion droplet pipeline where we get these like barcoded beads that have UUIDs made out of DNA. Uh, so literally just like ACs, Gs, and Ts, and we just make a random sequence of DNA that's never existed before. And uh, we have a bead covered in a specific UUID, and then a lot of those beads, every cell gets attached to one bead, so it gets covered in these UUIDs. So the, those UUIDs mean a particular cell. So then when we pull the cells back together and do the sequencing, all the samples that we get also have these barcodes on them, so we can aggregate back against which cells they came from. Uh, so it's, it's really cool. Um, the result is uh, the, the data we get out are these gene expression matrices, uh, which as you can see in the bottom middle here. Um, it's basically a, a giant sparse matrix that is uh, for every cell and every gene, how much was that cell expressing that gene? And then we can cluster the cells based on what genes they're expressing and infer what types they are and things that are going on with them. Uh, the Human Cell Atlas is, you can think of it like the Human Genome Project, but 20 years later in response to a different breakthrough in sequencing technology. Um, it's kind of just a, a lot of institutions trying to standardize how they run these assays, how they store and process the data, and the number of cells that people push through these experiments has been growing basically exponentially for about 10 years. Um, there's a couple more recent uh, data sets that are up to 2 million cells now in a single experiment. Uh, and that's to say nothing of the idea that if the experiments were done consistently, we could even concatenate all the cells readings across experiments and operate and analyze even larger data sets. Um, so there's a, the specter of uh, large data set sizes growing that we need software to solve. Um, so that's about how I ended up working on these problems. Uh, there's, um, I guess, to say a little more about these gene expression matrices, um, they're, they're mostly sparse. I, I mentioned the largest one is like 2 million cells, 30,000 genes in the uh, human genome. So you'd have like 60 billion uh, entries in an array. Uh, only about 1 billion of those would be non-zero. Um, so it's not like it's terribly large data, depending who you ask, but a lot of the analyses that are done to it are pretty complex, and there's room to um, apply some distributed systems and heavy software engineering principles to the analysis of this data. Um, there's a lot of really good tools already uh, from the Python and R ecosystems, mostly, uh, that analyze this data. Um, yeah. 
they're, they're pretty good. They're very accessible. You can just um, start them up in a notebook and uh, they work well. Uh, most people are analyzing much smaller data sets than the, the largest ones that I mentioned today. So um, we want to future proof this stuff though for uh, the possibility that these data sets continue getting much larger. And there's a lot of just software development principles that uh, would be nice to bring to bear on these things and um, generally avail ourselves of the benefits of stronger typing and uh, stuff like that. So um, yeah, so where does Scala fit into any of this? Um, the, the answer is not, not really anywhere today. Uh, <laughs> I'm kind of an island where in, in my part of the universe and trying to like put Scala on a lot of things and nobody has any idea what that means. Um, people use the, uh, their scripty, dynamic, uh, sciencey languages and they're very effective with them and they like them and bioinformatics is just this interesting parallel universe of software development in some ways. Um, I don't think they're wrong. It's really like a lot of people get a lot of stuff done uh, using these languages. Uh, but there's uh, just larger questions I have, I guess, about just how everything seems to be Python. And um, there's a lot of like systems that we rely on that are just like all, all Python. And maybe, I don't know, it's like we haven't, we've only had computers for like 60 years as a, as a society. I don't think we're very good at programming them yet. And a lot of the Python I see uh, bears that out. Uh, so, you know, hospitals and banks and everything. We have like all like 100% of it's like all all of AI is just like Python like p hacking of models that have very little theoretical basis, and we're gonna like upheave a lot of society and policy based on them. So it's kind of scary. Um, so that's why we want to use these Scala toys and do like better programming is the idea, I guess. Um, I'm just really interested in the idea that by combining a lot of these kind of fringe things that are pretty unique to the Scala ecosystem, uh, we can write a software in just a different and better way. And so I'm always exploring that a bit. So that brings me to this question of multi-dimensional arrays that I was uh, mostly going to talk about. So the standard is uh, NumPy, Python library for dealing with n-dimensional arrays. Um, and I guess we're, let's do an exercise seeing how much of that we can mimic in Scala uh, and put some static typing on it as well. Um, seems like I lost my, there we go. <sighs> okay, so yeah, uh, quick sketch of like basic array operations in NumPy. You can really easily make multi-dimensional arrays and slice them uh, and get scalars out or other n-dimensional arrays. You can set whole ranges in terms of n-dimensional arrays. Um, it's a very expressive API with very few characters. You can do a lot. It's a really um, uh, impressive tool. Um, it's, you know, you're working in Python, so anything that goes wrong goes wrong at runtime. Uh, I'll just show three classes of things you can do wrong that in principle maybe we could uh, statically check against, uh, tracking the element types in your array, uh, knowing what type you're getting out when you access an element, not uh, inserting an element that's the wrong type, uh, tracking the number of dimensions in the array, how many dimensions deep can you index into it before you are at a scalar or past the limit of the dimensions in that array, um, and also uh, index out of bound errors, I guess, like are the plague of everyone who uses arrays in any language, and maybe there's something there that we could do. Um, starting from this base where we just get runtime errors, we can imagine what this might look like in Scala. Uh, pretty minimal syntax changes, syntax changes, and we could get something that performs pretty similarly. Uh, and just throws you errors that even look like the Python errors if you want them to at runtime, and that's like in principle a thing that's possible. Um, what would this look like with better typing? Could all these errors be compile errors? Um, so the, the first one, I think, yes. Almost any reasonable implementation that we would do in a type language would give us the, the first one. Uh, the second one's a lot harder. I'm going to spend most of the rest of the talk talking about trying to do that. And the third one, I think, is like completely beyond my capability to, to do, and you would need uh, refined, full refined types for, and there's um, 
if people in this room want to talk about how to do that, that's, that would be really interesting to me, but um, not something I, I, I started out looking at some, I was like, can I do this? And I, I have a lot of steps of learning to go before I can do that, I think. But um, so this level two is kind of what we're shooting for. Um, but let's start by sketching out just a, a bare bones ND array in Scala and get element type safety. Uh, I hope this is big enough that people can see it. It's not that important. Uh, it's, you know, whatever. It's a, it, it's a class. There's, you take a shape that's some integers uh, and a flat array of elements. Uh, the contract here, this, this is one, this is a typical way to represent a multi-dimensional array. Uh, we, we have this logical higher dimensional structure to it, but we're going to store them all in one array because that's the easier data structure to work with. And then we'll just index into that thing based on these higher dimensional indices. Um, so I've given this uh, a getter and setter in terms of specific array elements. Uh, you just pass a, a var args of integers and you'll get an element back, hopefully, if you pass the right number. And likewise, you can uh, set, you can insert or overwrite a value in the array at a given index. Uh, and then I added a, uh, a bonus API that does uh, slicing in, with uh, some nice syntax trying to mimic what NumPy is able to do using the magnet pattern where we are, have this made up type slice that we are, is gonna represent any kind of range along each dimension that we want to index into. And uh, we can implicitly create those from a range of integers or uh, just a, a single integer itself or any arbitrary sequence. So, so this is enough, I mean, I've left the implementations out, but that's enough to get a pretty good approximation of some of the NumPy APIs we were looking at. Um, most importantly, maybe we get type safe element uh, accessing and setting. We can't write a string where it expects a character. Um, the set API is a little bit verbose. Um, maybe there's a way to make that slicker with assignment overloading. Um, I, I put in like a star uh, that, uh, syntax, which means like it's kind of like the colon in Python, where it'll just give you uh, the entire span along a given dimension. Uh, and we can compare that to the same thing in NumPy. And it's like pretty similar. It's like, fairly mechanical transformation between these two. Uh, in this example in particular, NumPy actually lets you set a string where it expects, expects a character and it only just takes the first character. So that was surprised me when I was making this example. Um, I don't know if it's representative, but um, yeah, the, the colon range syntax in Python is, is really um, ergonomic and I, I can't really think of a way to make something that easy to use in, in Scala, but uh, kind of get close, um, but yeah. So this, I, I feel like we, we can basically do that. It's not, it's not that interesting. Uh, maybe one of those is already out there. I, I guess you have this in some of the stuff that I built that I'll, I'll talk about shortly. Uh, as I mentioned, what we're really interested in is, well, for now, because it seems to be all, all that I thought I could do, is static typing the rank, the number of dimensions in the array, making that known to the type system. Uh, so let's try to do that. Uh, first approximation, we can just make a small change to the existing stub and give it a type parameter that's a type constructor that encodes how many dimensions the array is. And the first parameter, which is the, ac the actual shape, which previously was a, a var args or a sequence of integers, is now a, a shape of integers and the shape will tell you whether that's three or four or, or, or whatever. Um, and we just plumb that type parameter through places where we had just an, a sequence of unknown length before. And that should be most of what we need to do to change the APIs here, at least. Um, so that's, that's kind of cool. The, here are some examples of what these shape types can look like um, for arrays of dimension zero or one, two, three, four, et cetera. And these are, these are fairly friendly types, I think. They're accessible, they're just tuples where all the elements are the same type. Um, I don't know if, there's, if those exist already in some form, but uh, we'll explore that in a second. Uh, digging into some of the implementation of this ND array stub, now using these shape types, 
um, we can see a, a few of the APIs that we need them to support. The, you get all of these out of the box on a list uh, from the standard library, but these like you know four tuple shapes and three tuple shapes need to be able to roughly support these operations as well. The first thing I'm doing, the first line there is an interesting one where just right after we create this array, we need to compute the dimension strides. And that's basically, since we're mapping between this higher dimensional space to this linear array that actually holds all the elements, um, if you increase your coordinates by one in the highest dimension, you're jumping over a, a ton of elements in the linear space. And the number is actually the, the product of all the other dimension sizes below it. And that's true for every dimension. So right out of the gate, we just do a scan write with a product, and that creates, that computes like a running product from right to left over the dimension sizes, which gives us the strides for every dimension. And at the end, as a bonus, we get the total size of the array, which we want to check against the total length of the elements we came in. We just got to do that at runtime, I think. Um, but you can see two, two things we want that are like list-like things, but we want these shape classes that I showed as like tuples where all the elements are the same type to also support uh, scans. And something like this list unapply uh, destructor is, would, would be nice. And you can also see we have a, a size operator, which makes sense, like all of those tuples kind of trivially have a, a size property. And they should be able to do zips and folds. That's a lot of interesting operations. Those are the, these are the shapes we're thinking about again. Uh, the zip in particular is interesting because zip on regular lists is really kind of like dragons full. Uh, whereas, because if, one's, if they're not the same length, then you just lose elements. But with these, zip is much more well behaved. Um, two, three tuples, even of different types, you can zip them and you know you'll get a three tuple of the, like, the pairs between those types. Um, so, just listing out the things that we need these uh, shapes to be able to do. Um, and that it's natural for them to do. So they, they seem like functors. You should be able to map over these. Uh, you should be able to reduce and fold them. Uh, they're, I think they're well-behaved traverses, uh, which is great. We love traverses. Everything's a traverse. Uh, that's, that's interesting. Um, I originally made them, when I implemented this, I made them applicatives. I think that was a mistake. Um, I, I gave them the, the pure operation, given an element would just duplicate that element that many times. Um, but I don't, I, I think I wanted it partly because I wanted semi-groupal product, which has the same type signature as, as the zip that I'm referring to, or if you have like an FA and an FB, you should be able to combine them into an F of A comma B tuples. Um, but after staring at it enough, I decided that there should just be a separate zip type class, and that's what I use. Um, so some of these uh, list operations are uh, interesting and fairly simple to implement. Um, they're not monads. That's an interesting observation. They're, like, you can't flat map these things. Um, if, you, if you have a three shape and you turn every element into a three shape, you, you don't have a, a three shape, or maybe I don't know. I, have to, I, I think I think they're not flat, they're not monads, but maybe I'm wrong about that. Um, and then yeah, I, so I needed that uh, the, the scan type class. I don't think that's kind of canonically implemented in cats or anywhere. And so I made that with just like some what I felt were ergonomic APIs around scans left and right, and optionally including or excluding the first and last elements because the standard scans are always awkward because you end up with one extra element, but it's not like really well represented in the type system. Okay, so a lot of this stuff doesn't have to do with the fact that these things are array shapes. There's some, there's like a more fundamental data structure here that I'm just gonna talk about briefly, uh, which I've been referring to as S lists. I'm sure there's a better name for it. Uh, I've, I, I think there's a thing called Nap Napierian functors that I think might be this, uh, but in, in the literature, but I'm not sure. Um, but it's basically like uh, H lists where, so you know the length in the type system, but all the elements are the same type. Um, and so I, I, this table was helpful for me, where you have this space where data structures that are list-like uh, can have their length be known in the type system or not, only at, at the value level. And they can have elements that are all the same type or elements that are homogenous. And so our regular list has homogenous elements, uh, but the length can be anything at runtime. 
Uh, and usually, I think most of us are, at least I, I, prior to this, I, I interacted with lists a lot, and I interact with hlists a lot. hlists are a huge jump in, in complexity um, because you, you have the type level length and also the heterogeneous elements. Um, and so like hlists don't conform to any of the type, uh, the cat's type classes, for example. Um, so they're, they're really a, a whole other animal. Um, but the, these s lists uh, do, they're, as we saw, they're, they're well behaved um, in, in terms of a lot of the existing cat's type classes. And they're a much simpler thing to reason about. Uh, so I thought that was interesting. So I implemented them with some clever syntax where you know it just uses the list colon colon operator, kind of like shapeless does. Uh, my like uh, empty list is this logical bottom Unicode symbol, and you can create them, map over them, fold, reduce, traverse. Uh, you can I don't know if it's easy to see in this example, but the traverse sequence operation, which just kind of goes between f of g of t and g of f of t. Uh, is really just acts like a matrix transpose here. So you can just keep sequencing back and forth and you go between this two shape of three shapes and a three shape of two shapes. Um, so, and you have a destructuring assignment also there. Uh, so that's fine. Uh, we're, we're gonna use that in the ND array libraries. Here's a little bit of under the hood implementing it that I ran into some problems getting all the inductive type derivations to work. Um, I think because they're higher kinded types, you, you want to define a type class for one and have, and then derive uh, an instance for its successor, let's say, in, this, the, in the usual way we do in shapeless. But I think because they're higher kinded, the uh, implicit resolver just really can't uh, figure it out. I, 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 I thought I had filed a bug about this, but I don't think I have. I, I think there's some, something there. It's possible I'm just doing it wrong. Um, but so I've had to like unroll all, uh, manual instances for some of these things. I just, for all of these, I basically just went up to nine dimensions and said that's probably enough for anyone. Um, and it's, it's basically, you know, you can pretend it's like all proper and type level downstream as a user. Um, so, all right, that's that. Uh, and then, yeah, so the, the, then I have an ND arrays module that uses those as the shape types for some uh, ND array implementations. Uh, there's one that's just in memory uh, that I'm, I'm calling vector, but it's basically like that stub we were looking at before. Uh, and then there's another one that's like lazy and disk backed. Um, and they both just conform to this really simple ND array type class array like, which just says like you have a shape type, you can tell me what your shape is, and you can let me randomly access elements. Um, and so I'd, I'd like to add a more full featured API to that, uh, of course, but that's the start. And there's some like test code verifying things about them. Um, okay, so then one more interesting thing, getting back towards the the data I actually want to analyze, the single cell sequencing data, um, is that we store those. They're, they're kind of large. We want to like store them in chunks and process them in a distributed way. <clears throat> um, so there's this library called Zar that's from the Python community, and it's like a multi-dimensional array container format. It will store chunked arrays on disk for you. Every chunk is a, its own file, so it plays well with a like Hadoop Spark style of distributed processing, where you can just point every worker at a different partition chunk file, and they'll just do whatever they need to with it, uh, all in parallel. Um, you can write them out in parallel as well. Everyone's writing their own file. Um, so that's in contrast to HDF5, which, which is what is used a lot of the rest of the time. It's just these like single giant files that are just harder to deal with in those kind of ways. Um, there's a few other language implementations, and I, so I wanted to make one in Scala so I can deal with this single cell data in Scala. And uh, to do so, I needed this ND array library, basically. So this is what the, the czar array type that I created looks like. And I guess the most interesting thing is the last two, so it's got a lot of type members. I just made everything type members because in different contexts, you might want, you might know some of these things statically and not others. Uh, sometimes I will, somebody will give me a data set. I don't know what the element type is gonna be or how many dimensions it is. So I wanna open it up, uh, let the, the plumbing figure that out and have those types be actually, actually exist in the variables, but I just didn't know them statically. And then I can cast it to the thing that I now know it actually is, or just reload it as the types 
uh, as its proper types. Um, but so it's like excessively kind of like dependently typed. And the, the last two type members are both two potentially different ND array types that this larger czar array can use. One is to store an n-dimensional array of the chunks, and then the second is to, for each of those chunks to store the n-dimensional array of the elements that it is in charge of. And you, you often want those to be different. It's like in a distributed context, it's common that the, the driver node will store pointers to all of the partitions in memory, uh, but you definitely don't want all the partitions keeping their, their data in memory, so you want two different implementations there. Um, I also threw in, so there's a type parameter for the, for the index, a type member for the index, which can be an int or a long, because I've seen uh, arrays in the wild that had more than int dot max value uh, size on, on one dimension. Uh, so felt like a thing we should just be able to throw in a type parameter and let it sort itself out. Uh, in practice, it's been a lot uh, more complicated than that. But, um, and then, yeah, you have type aliases down below for specifying which of these things you know in any given context. Like sometimes you know the element, but you don't really want to have the rank be in the type system uh, or vice versa. Uh, so these are this is a simple example of using this. It's, I mean, simple, I guess, is uh, doing a lot of work there. Uh, you ha can have like a, a class that has two fields that are each uh, czar arrays. Here we have a two-dimensional array of integers and a three-dimensional array of doubles. And I just uh, assign values to those and write it out to Google Cloud Store. Um, so the bare bones stuff here basically all works. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I've, I've used it to convert between HDF5 and ZAR files in the cloud. And some of these things are, have been useful already. Um, I've also been working on a Scala.js static web app to like, look at these files in the cloud, um, which has been a fun project. And it's portable, so it works on Java. So it's like kind of a JavaScript implementation of Czar as well, which is nice. Uh, so things I'd like to do, um, there, there are other NDRA implementations out there that are much better. And with the way that the Czar array is structured, uh, you should be able to just plug those in. Like, so like Breeze, I know, is really performant, and it's uh, for one and two dimensional arrays. And that's a lot of what I'm dealing with some of the time. So I should just be able to use that as one of my backing arrays in these are uh, arrays. And um, the, the slicing APIs uh, I have not implemented in, um, in the, this, this rank safe version of it. Um, so would like to do that. Uh, mapping and transforming these things is a little bit complicated also because you need some extra, like a context parameter in terms of the output type that you're mapping to, like the, the B. Um, and that's common across, like even even like arrays in Scala, like you need a class tag in order to create the thing. And so I feel like there's a, some other type class there that I'd like to build. Maybe people, maybe somebody already has. Um, that would be interesting to hear. Um, so yeah, lot, lots to do for sure. Yeah, it's not going to solve a lot of people's problems quite yet, but it's an interesting journey. Uh, so uh, yep, some basic ND array implementations with statically typed ranks, ranks uh, the S lists that underpin that, and the czar uh, spec implementation that uses those uh, are all sitting in this GitHub repo that you can look up. Uh, I'd love, it's, it already works on JS and JVM, which is great. Hopefully we'll get native someday. Uh, it's really cool when these things work, and but there's definitely some rough edges. <laughs> And I haven't even really got to like benchmarking them. I'm sh I, I feel like this is going to be like the performance is going to be terrible just out of the gate because these abstractions are all so heavyweight. Um, but uh, I think there's still like it's it's really cool to be able to program with these like um, very sophisticated tools that, as far as I know, only exist in these forms in in the Scala world in in many cases. Um, so that's great. That that's all I have. Uh, thank you. Couple questions. Just a quick one. Uh, why did you uh, implement your own S list rather than using the uh, shapeless sized? Uh, maybe because I didn't realize that's what it, what that was. 
<laughs> is, is it? I, I believe so. Cool. That's good to know. Um, uh, what are some of the obstacles or downsides to like wrapping something that's more directly just NumPy it with like a type checker? That that's not like a low level t like type thing, but just like like we'll just t check the types at a higher level and then let it do NumPy underneath. Yeah, I mean that makes sense in principle. Uh, I know more about how to do it this way like I don't know I guess maybe is do you mean like so NumPy I think is just all oh. like native it's like implemented in C under the hood and it has cool. just Python bindings right so you would just call into that directly and then, yeah I was wondering if you, you had thought about that or if there are any obstacles you would foresee in that direction uh, well some of these uh, a lot of libraries adjacent to this stuff, there's like a reference C implementation. I think there, a lot of times there's a question of do you want to just like JNI out to some to a native binary? And there's a lot of trade-offs with that that I haven't personally learned the pain points of the hard way, but I've heard stories of it, and it it, it could be a good way to go. I don't know, but I, I just don't know. Uh, yeah. Hey, Chris, the the size thing that just that. Are all the elements the same type in those? Great. Because <laughs> I've, I've seen, I've looked at that. I don't know. There's definitely, there's things in Shapeless I've looked at and, been, and not realized they were exactly what I wanted, like this, probably. So. Cool. All Thank right. You. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ryan.